Hello, this is Patricia Martin, and I will be your host for this special series on Marion Woodman. Marion Woodman was one of the most influential and prolific Jungian analysts of our time. As one of Carl Jung's early students, she did the work of adapting Jung's ideas, especially those about the relationship between the psyche and the body, so that they could be understood by many. Vulnerable, gutsy, risk-taking, she was prone to supernatural bursts of creative energy. Marian Woodman left a legacy of theories and practices that have stood the test of time. To honor her contributions to Jungian psychology, our podcast team here at the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago created this podcast series, and we hope you enjoy it. Hello and welcome. This is Patricia Martin, and I'll be your host today as we continue our look at the legacy of Marian Woodman. Marian Woodman's analytical journey led her to what some Jungians thought were unorthodox territories. And before long, a dream told her to take the images from the dream and put them into her body. Years of conscious, personal analytical work, integrating imagery with movement, combined with the study of Carl Jung's psychology, brought Marian to the profound insight that the body informs the soul as much as the soul informs the body. Another concept of Marian's that was ahead of its time. For her, both image and bodily symptom are both symbolic ways of working. Paying attention to a headache, for instance, or a back problem can be as enlightening as confronting a shadowy figure in a dream, thought Marian. Joining us today, we have Elaine Mansfield, a nutritionist, a physical trainer, and a women's health counselor for 25 years. Elaine taught workshops herself and trained individuals until 2011. A longtime student of Marian Woodman and the Dalai Lama, she blogs on grief, loss, and the restorative powers of nature. Elaine's book, Leaning Into Love, A Spiritual Journey Through Grief, won a gold medal for independent publishing. Her TEDx talk, Good Grief, What I Learned from Loss, has almost 300,000 viewers. She's now working on a book about monarch butterflies. Welcome to Jungian Anthology, Elaine. Thank you. We're so happy to have you. It's, it's lovely to be here. Oh, great. I'm so pleased because, you know, as, as you and I have gone back and forth, it struck me that your, your finding Marion really was the answer to a request out there to the universe. You were looking for a mentor. And then you, in 1999, and sorry, in 1988, you attended one of her workshops. Can you describe what that meeting, that meeting was like? Well, let me just start by saying I had worked um, on, with Jung and uh, with male teachers, my male teacher since 1967. So I was primed in Jungian psychology um, and and astrology and many things that Marion also was interested in. So, but I we studied men and we we studied male philosophy, Greek philosophy. It was all man, male, male, male. And I was really hungry for the feminine and for a a feminine teacher. So I so Marion wasn't so well known in 1988. But there was a workshop and there and there were about maybe 50 people there. I didn't know until later that that would be the, you know, one of the smallest things I ever went to that Marion gave. But um, there were approximately 50 people and it was on the Black Madonna. And uh, she came in and she looked. She kind of looked like a um, school teacher from England or she was from Canada, but you know, she wasn't flashy. She got flashier and wore more beautiful colors and things like that as she got older. But at that time she had, she looked very conventional and she came in with her purse and her and her shoes and her this and that. And then she kicked her shoes off and started. <laughs> she says, I like to feel my feet on the ground. 
And uh, and then later I read or remember that she did that at her marriage. She took her shoes off to walk down the aisle. <laughs> so, um, so um, I was there with some women I didn't know very well. Um, and they were not, they didn't want to do any of the body work. They wanted to go out. They wanted to go out to eat and this and that. And I said, no, I've never done this before. Um, and I want to do the body work. So there I was that night, uh, lying on the ground with, uh, lying on the floor with, you know, envisioning, uh, a rose in my belly and, you know, working with a dream image and having Marion guide me through my body. And I'd never had that experience with a woman teacher before. And it was really, it was amazing. And at the end of the workshop, after three days, I gave a, she asked her for dreams about the Black Madonna. And I told a dream, and I've got dream journals that go back to 1967. And I, wow. can, I cannot find that dream. Really? It you know, just dropped into the great unconscious. It was, I know there was a very large black woman in it. And that's all I remember. You know, I was reading something else about this, this image of the black Madonna. And uh, apparently, as Marion talked with other Jungians about this image that had, it, it was starting to show up in, in her one-on-one -on -one conversations with analysis. It was showing up in her conversations with other Jungians who said that they were hearing reports that people were having this archetype appear in their dreams. Mm -hmm. And Marion finally surmised that this was a symbol of a new consciousness to start trying to break through and I think about this and I think, wow, this is, that's a huge idea. But at the, at the root of it, Marion kept pulling this imagery, these archetypal images into people's bodies to help them sort of make connection to the soul. What did that actually feel like as you were lying on the ground, you've got this image in your mind and you're pulling it into your body? Did, did, it, did it feel different or funny or strange it felt it felt wonderful to me I, I I it felt healing it felt uh, like parts of my body uh that were not very alive there wasn't much consciousness there that she was really bringing consciousness to my body I thought it was a wonderful a wonderful thing to do. <laughs> and I, I love doing that with her for years afterward, you know, doing that, the body work part. Is that what made you continue with her? First of all, how long was your affiliation with Marion? Well, I met her in 88. And my last, in 1988, my last letter from her was 2011. And I think she was having a hard time writing in 2011 and you know you could tell that she was really struggling but she was still trying and uh and so however many years that is it's uh, what 23 24 years something like wow. that wow so what was it that really kept you coming back well i didn't uh i took a break oh. because uh, my husband was teaching at Colgate. We were living where I live now in the country near Ithaca, New York. And we were always on the road and my mother was dying and I couldn't get to Canada. And then, and then my husband was asked to speak with her uh, in, I think it was 2002. And, and, you know, he called me, he said, who do you want to meet more than anybody? <laughs> and, I, and I said, I don't know. And he said, guess what? I just got asked to teach at uh, a workshop with Marion Woodman because he wrote about synchronicity. So I was so jealous. I was, <laughs> I mean, first I was really happy and I was really happy. And then I saw my husband looking at Marion like, you know, he was in love, but, but, 
not that I wasn't jealous, like uh, in any kind of a sexual way, but jealous uh-huh. of that he was the one teaching with her and not me. And he was, and I, and so it was, I was really mad at him and I was up all night. I mean, I knew it wasn't him and I was up all night and I realized this was 2002. And I realized I have to get there. I have to find a way to get to Canada. I can't like say I'm too busy. This is happening. My mother's doing this and that. So when my mother actually died, I was in Canada with Mary and and my husband already had cancer, but he was with my mother. So, uh, so uh, it was a, I've written about this and it was, I, I was up all night, like doing active imagination, trying to deal with my anger and, you know, knowing that it was, it was my anger at myself that I had not that I wasn't stretching far enough to get to her. And after that, I started going to, uh, starting in 2003, I started going to more body soul rhythm uh, workshops. And and she also was doing dream workshops in London. And she was also doing things at University of Toronto, which men could go to. So my husband and I would go together because he, he was in love with her too. He was a physicist. <laughs> he was a physicist. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, this is we, we. I have encountered these stories more than once. Uh, there's a darling story about when Marion was teaching. Uh, it was a high school drama teacher before her Jungian training, and she called the home of one of her students, and she got into a conversation with the father, um, and because the son wasn't home. And the father wrote a note on the chalkboard, return the call from the enchantress. <laughs> yeah. And it was understood in the family who the enchantress was. It was Marion Woodman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but she, she, she um, when, when she did her, I'm curious about this uh, workshop she did with, for men. Was that with, jo- with, uh, Robert Bly or was no that... that was not the Robert Bly workshop although I'm in a women's mythology group we spent two years on that book that they did together oh really? uh, the, yeah the maidens are I mean so um so no it wasn't that she was doing these uh weekend workshops at University of Toronto and I think to try to bring men in and sometimes to give a place for men to also do this body work. And she would just choose a short fairy tale and we would work with it. And then she would have us do impossible things like make a play and somehow it would all work out and be incredible. And, uh, and so my husband could go to those and he, he wanted to work with her, you know, so it was a way to, and he, and sometimes there would be, 40 people there are, you know, mostly, you know, a mix of students and I mean, college students and then older people and, and my husband, there'd be three or four men, you know, so Mm -hmm. there were, it was, uh, it was um, uh, an opportunity for him. And I think we probably went to about four of those. Mm -hmm. She didn't do them for too long. But she continued uh, it it seems to me that she, she, she had a, a soul of a teacher. While she was a great writer, she wrote many books. In her heart of hearts, there was something about the need to transfer what she was experiencing and learning. And I thought it was fascinating that she even started to develop her own bodily symptoms mm-hmm. as she grew ill with cancer. And leading up to that, she started feeling symptoms and started using her theories on herself where she would go in, she would take the image that she saw in a dream and take it into her body and sort of use it as a way to assess what was going on inside of her. I, did she ever talk about that with you? Yeah, she had me do, uh, uh, on, I think two or maybe three times we did, um, we did, uh, we talked about her body stuff mm. and, uh, 
two of those times at least, I, we were with my friend uh, Gita Rama Murthy, who is a, a, a both a psychiatrist and a um, and an internist. So Gita and uh, and Marion and I would you know go through her symptoms and try to tackle ways to make her feel better and make her stronger and uh so we had those interviews a couple of different times and it was it was just always powerful to do whatever i you know i love telling i love you know i've got dreams all around me here <laughs> because i loved doing dream work with her but that was any doing anything with her was an honor you know this is a common theme as well that people talk about her level of charisma mm -hmm. that was unlike anyone else you had met. Yeah. And I, I can you have you ever been able to pin that down? What about Marion Woodman was so remarkably charismatic? Um, that is it's a, it is a hard question, but I felt like she was so authentically herself and so authentically in the moment and she was also so intuitive and she knew the right way to be in any situation that came up and if something came up that, and something happened everything you know the altar got spilled and you know things went crazy she just laughed <laughs> and she didn't have and you know the Dalai Lama is like that. And one time I told her a dream she uh, where she was she was an old crone and she had all this makeup on and she laughed and laughed waking Marion as I told her the dream. And and in the dream she was laughing a lot. She said to me, "Have you ever heard the Dalai Lama laugh?" I said, "Yeah, Marion, it was just like that." <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way you were laughing, just like that. Deep belly laugh, let it rip. And I, I felt like she was, uh, that she knew a lot. She had studied so much. And she, uh, and then, and she also, she was, you know, she had, she had a kind of weak sensation function, which she admitted herself. So she brought in all these people like Mary Hamilton and Ann Skinner to do body work. And uh, I just felt like she was so honest about who she was and where she was, but she'd also really done the deep work and it was clear. So that was sort of radiant in her is I guess what I'm picking up from you, that deep work. It, 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 it alters a person somehow in a way that I think is resonant. But I, I think there's something to be said about this business of authenticity because, you know, today when we talk about authenticity, it seems to me like, you know, it, it's a well-manicured look that makes it look like you're not trying. <laughs> but back in those days before the internet, being authentic, I think, had a different level of courage involved. Um, and for Marion, from everything I can gather, she just she wasn't interested in a manicured uh persona do i have that right she she just she just she just could walk out there she had the courage to just walk out there and not try to manage the impression is am i getting this right well i think so but i also saw her change physically a lot in the years i knew her and i and i think she enjoyed having her long wavy hair that she had it toward the end of her life. And she started wearing these beautiful shades of blue and purple and things that were really gorgeous on her. And so she liked that part too. She liked being, she liked beauty. And, uh, but, you know, one of the things I need to bring in right here is that toward the last time I saw her in the middle of a workshop, she would for she would forget we were working on Eros and Psyche and she would forget the myth. She knew I really knew the myth and it taught the myth. So she she was not a bit ashamed of saying, Elaine, what happens next? And I wasn't one of her main students. 
It's just that I really knew that. I knew the myth of Eros and Psyche well because of my mythology group, which is, I don't lead it. It's a leaderless women's group, but we've been studying together since 1990. Wow. So, and a lot of us have seen Marion Woodman, but I got the most involved with, with seeing her. And, um, but anyway, so I really knew that myth and Marion knew that. So she was never, so she started, she was starting to lose her memory some. But, uh, and things would kind of go blank. And then she would say, and what happens next, Elaine? And then if, if it was something, if, if it were something that somebody else was knew more about, she'd, she'd ask them to help. She wasn't ashamed of, of the aging process, which I'm now, as I'm aging, understanding how powerful that is. Well, yes, you've written books about this yourself. And, um, about grief and loss. And, and I just wonder if those experiences of grief and loss, are they uh, experiences that alter the relationship between the soul and the body? I mean, do, do, do blockages begin to show up? And do you use the work that you did with Marion to help yourself or other people kind of break that down? How, how does grief and loss, how does it get somatized in our bodies? I guess, let me start there. Yeah. Well, I, uh, my husband was sick for two years. And during that time, Marion and I corresponded a lot. And she talked a lot about Ross and a lot about how awful it would be for her if, if uh, you know, if Ross died. And it turned out he did die before her, but I think she had so much memory, she had so much memory lost by then that it, I doubt it was as trauma, traumatic as it might have been. But mm -hmm. I wasn't in touch with her then when he died. So, so for me, uh, I was from a family where no one expressed grief. I just let it rip. I just cried for a year. And I, I cried and I walked, I cried and I walked. And then I started looking for beauty. And, and, you know, I, I just go out, I, I live on beautiful land and I look for one small, beautiful bug <laughs> or one small, beautiful blossom or, you know, one bird. Uh, and I just started finding beauty in the world and when I came back from my husband, the day he died, but uh, he died like just after midnight. And the next morning I walked on my land and there were lupins blooming everywhere. And they were just, they were essentially saying, life is beautiful. <laughs> life is beautiful. And I couldn't, uh, I couldn't go down. I was really sad. I still am. You can feel, you can hear, right. mm -hmm. but I didn't, you know, I didn't go down on a hole of grief because all that beauty was there. And I kept, uh, Marion kept writing to me during that period a lot. And I would get letters from her and they were so supportive and so, so kind. And I mean, I know she wrote a lot of people. I don't know how she had so much. I don't know how she did it. No, I don't either. Tells me I about mean, this. I mean, I've got a stack of letters. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how she did it. You know, I envy her tenacity to maintain letter communications with so many people and they're deep letters. Yeah. Everyone reports them to be treasures. Yeah. But I want to, I just so fascinated with this idea that one of the legacy pieces for you is that you were able to focus on, put your focus on one small aspect of beauty every day to climb yourself out of what otherwise would have been a downward spiral of grief. I still do it. <laughs> yeah, what a beautiful, simple practice. I, and I do it like I'm on Facebook and only, I mean, there's so many lousy things about Facebook, mm -hmm. but every day I share a photograph. Uh, I started doing photography at that time. My husband had always been the pho photographer in the family. 
and I, I got a much simpler camera and I started taking photographs of nature and photographs with my dogs and, you know, if they were doing something cute, you know, and, and, uh, and I started, so I started sharing one beautiful thing a day. And it's also become kind of a teaching thing of around nature. Uh, this is what happens to swallowtail butterflies and or caterpillars. And here's a swallowtail caterpillar. And I raise monarch. I have a, I have a butterfly nursery. And yes, so, I, when I reached out to you, I remember you had just come in from the butterfly nursery and you <laughs> well, were it's reporting just on, on all the eggs that you, it, you had harvested <laughs> and, and that you were carrying on this monarch um, lineage. And I just thought, wow, this is a woman who knows how to live her life. Well, I, I need, I'm in my deafness really limit, limits what I can do socially. Um, having a cochlear implant means I can talk to you and I can talk to one or two people, but if I'm in a restaurant or if I'm in a music venue or something like that, I'm just lost. I can't oh, hear anything. Yes. It's, it's probably just a cacophony yeah. of, of sound, right? The cochlear so implant you, I, I was just about to say, this has tuned you in. In a, in a different way, and I, I'm sure your training as you know a nutritionist and a and a and a physical trainer also played a role. But I I continue to find more and more about Marion Woodman's insistence, and it was an insistence that the soul and the body are in constant interaction and constant interplay. I, I have this quote that I you know I'm inspired to read. She wrote, the way to healing lies in finding a connection between body and soul. Soul needs the body as much as the body needs the soul. Each is out of context without the other, an abandoned fragment of what it is. And so I'm, I'm thinking about the enchantment of nature, mm -hmm. how that becomes a vehicle, a vector, if you will, for making that cozy alliance between the body and the soul it became my healer and it became my healing practice to be in nature year round because i live you know i live um, in western in the finger lakes of new york and it's cold here in the winter but That's i've true. got but i i've got two dogs and i have dogs because of their companions but also because they keep me walking and going out. I can't say, no, I don't feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I, um, so I, I, I feel that uh, being, having this relationship with nature and this land, my husband and I bought this land, which is a complete, we bought a complete dump of a 200 year old house, which is now a beautiful, old farmhouse and um we bought it because of the sunsets there's beautiful views over seneca lake valley beautiful views of the west and i see the sunset year round and that relationship the land is so strong and rooted for me and i know the trees <laughs> And my husband's ashes are buried in the woods. And, you know, I know which tree to hug. <laughs> so, oh. Wow. So that, yeah. And I know the seasons of the wildflowers and the seasons of the butterflies and the birds and the bluebirds. And, you know, I watch all that very carefully. And it's partly because I'm deaf. And because hearing is, uh, because hearing is a strain, I think I became very visual. Oh, that makes sense. It's a compensation. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I wonder if, you know, I'm, I, I'm trying to make all these connections between your story and our research on Marion's legacy, but I'm going to just ask you flat out, Elaine, as you think about her work and you were a longtime affiliate of hers, you attended many workshops, you were friends. As you stand back, what do you think Marianne Woodman's legacy is? Big question. 
It is a big question. I, for me, uh, she opened the whole world of goddess mythology. And the group that I work with, which has been working over, you know, the group we've, it, we've been working since 1990, so over 30 years, I'm working on the Black Madonna. We're working on the Black Madonna because Sophia and the Black Madonna kind of disappeared into each other. And so I feel like Marion made us look for the feminine in nature and in ourselves and in mythology and all over the place where it was not being, there was no attention to it. I went to a workshop where she wanted to talk. It was right after Princess Diana died and she wanted to talk about Princess Diana and I thought, what? What are we going to talk about Princess Diana before? But Marion was interested. It was so, it was a teaching for me. She was interested in how the world responded to that, to the death of the young princess who had stood up to the patriarchy. And I feel like Marion really brought that into life. Uh, that that sense that the feminine must be found and nurtured and brought to consciousness and then married to the masculine, <laughs> you know? Yes. Well, she and, loves and, men. <laughs> uh, well, and, and feminine and masculine are now concepts in a way yeah. that they used to be very much embodied. Now they're more like concepts. But I also think, you know, Marion had a sense of what the collective was yearning for, what the collective was hungry for. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I was thinking about this, this idea, as you were talking, thinking about this idea of opening up the, the, and dusting off the archetypes of, you know, the female archetypes, the, the, the female mythology, the, the fairy tales that feature the clever woman or the woman who absolutely just insists that she must live out her life on her own terms. And it seems to me that we're still yearning for that despite all of, you know, the, the decades of feminism, there's something at the root that we're still gnashing at. Yeah. Does this make sense to you? Well, it makes sense to me personally because I live here on 71 acres next to the National Forest. And can you, you can imagine, and my husband died in 2008, you can imagine how many people told me, you can't live there. Oh. <laughs> you can't stay alone. there by yourself. <laughs> and I, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, so, you know, I have helpers, but... Um, there's this uh, sense of a woman not being able to do things. Uh, she can't do things, all, all these things by herself, but I know a lot of women who can and are. And um, so I think that, uh, I think Marion brought uh, a sense of empowerment mm -hmm. to what a woman can do because she would talk about how people said, you can't do that, Marion. You can't go to India. And it was why, in, it was in India when a major guru died and all day long, and it was powerful. There were a quarter of a million people at the funeral and all day long in my head, like a mantra was, this is the death of all the fathers. This is the death of all the fathers. And that was 1994. Wow. And, and so that was, you know, it was for me, it was a wake up call to that. I needed the feminine. I needed the feminine. I needed feminine teacher and feminine teachings and I needed body. Well, thank you Elaine, <laughs> for that insight as the, as, as what people call the patriarchy begins to wane and and if Marion is correct, a new consciousness is pushing through and it is mm -hmm. feminine. And then women will learn more about 
how to rely upon each other and themselves. And so thank you. Thank you for that nugget. But also thank you for the bigger picture of Marion. Is there can anything learning in you that you wanted to leave us with? Can I say one? Yeah, I want to say one more thing. Marion said, because, you know, there are these wars and this craziness. And this was, this was true, you know, 20 years ago. And she'd, she'd say, you don't think this is going to be easy, do you? <laughs> you didn't. You know, the thing of the, of, you know, bringing the feminine to a patriarchal world. You don't think it's going to be easy, do you? <laughs> and then she would just laugh. And because people did, they thought, oh, we're just going to do this. Well, it's, it's a grind. Just even, I'm not even sure we can save the earth, but, but she would want us to try. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it's our survival. It's our mutual survival. So yeah, the time is now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there is, there's not going to be any later if we don't do no. it now. Right. That's right. There will be no later. And later. I feel Marion doing it with a laugh. Oh. <laughs> no, I mean, I feel she could, she could bring joy to the hardest situations. So thank you. Thank you for sharing these beautiful stories about, about Marianne. It helps her, you know, it helps paint the picture for the audience about who she was and, and her, you know, why she still is important and her work is important. So mm -hmm. Elaine Mansfield, and we will put links down in the bottom of your books and to your website so people can get to know your work. And I want to thank you for taking your time and, and, and sharing all your wisdom with us today. Well, thank you for asking me. Our pleasure. Yeah.